This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. Would you take your Bibles this morning and turn to the book of Romans, chapter number 12. Romans, chapter number 12. Those of you that are in our adult Sunday school class know that we've been going through the book of Romans. Uh, we are just finished with chapter number 7, but we're working our way through the book of Romans, one chapter at a time on Sunday mornings. And the book of Romans is, of all the books in the Bible, it is my favorite book of the Bible. It's my favorite book of the Bible because it deals with everything that a person really needs to know about the subject of salvation. Not only how to get saved, but why you need to be saved and, and what you and I should do, how we should live after we are saved because we're saved. Anyway, the book of Romans uh, is certainly my favorite book of the Bible. And I want to bring a message to you this morning out of Romans chapter 12, just the first two verses. Because a Christian that grasps the understanding of these two verses, their entire Christian life has the potential to be revolutionized, to be changed in a most magnificent way. So if you're able to, would you please stand with me out of respect for God's word as I read just the first two verses of Romans chapter 12. Here's what the Apostle Paul says, writing under inspiration of the Holy Ghost. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye, may be, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. In verse 1, the Apostle Paul says we ought to present ourselves as a living sacrifice to God. Not a dead sacrifice, but a living sacrifice. And he says that's your reasonable service. He's talking to Christians because he said, I beseech you therefore, brethren. So he's telling Christians that the most reasonable thing in the world is that if you know Jesus as your Savior, if He saved your soul, it's only reasonable that you should present yourself a living sacrifice for Him. But verse 2 is the verse I want to key in on this morning. Verse 2 said, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. A Christian's mind ought to be the mind of God. To the best that we're able, humanly speaking, we ought to think about things, we ought to view things, we ought to interpret things the way God would interpret them. That is, a Christian ought to view everything in life going on around him or her and make the decisions that we make every day, big decisions and little decisions, they all ought to be made with, what does God want me to do? What does God say about this? I'd like to bring you a message this morning entitled, Developing a Biblical Worldview. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray this morning that for the next few minutes you would allow us to put away from our minds all the other busy things that are going on in life. And Lord, help us to reflect just upon you and upon your word for a few minutes. But Lord, I pray this will be a few minutes that will totally change our Christian lives. 
Lord, that we would leave this place spiritually never the same again for having been here and having paid attention, paid heed to the Word of God. Lord, I pray it would affect our lives in a meaningful way this morning. For it's in Jesus' name and for His sake we pray. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. When I was a teenager... Some of you know this and some of you don't, so I'll share a little bit of my testimony this morning. I grew up in a Christian home, a mama and daddy who were both saved. Uh, I I didn't have grandparents on one side because they had already passed away by the time I was about five years old. But on my mother's side, I still had a grandma and a grandpa. They both were Christians. They both loved the Lord, and I spent lots uh, lots of time over at grandma and grandpa's house. So I grew up in a Christian home, and I got saved at a young age. I was six years old when I prayed and asked the Lord to save me, and I was baptized shortly after that. I was also very blessed in that as I was growing up, my daddy, who was a police officer in Atlanta and didn't make a lot of money, he went and got an extra job and sometimes two or three extra jobs on the side to pay for my brother and I to go to a Christian school. I'm not saying that you have to go to a Christian school, obviously, to love God, but I'm grateful that my mom and dad made the sacrifice, and I know it was a sacrifice, for me to be able to go to a Christian school. As a result of going to a good Christian school, I learned much about the Bible, and I was around teachers who loved God, and they inculcated upon me a desire to serve God, to live for God, since I was a Christian also. I can remember, though, when I was a teenager, there was one particular time that I was having a discussion with an adult. He was not an adult from school, not an adult from church, but it was an adult who claimed to be a Christian. In fact, I'm almost positive they were and are a Christian, But we were having a discussion about some big issue going on in the world at the time. And to be honest with you, I don't even remember what the issue was at this point. But the adult was saying, well, you know, thus and such and thus and such. And I said, well, but. And they said, but what? I said, but, you know, the Bible says this or that. And the adult looked at me and said, Why do you always bring the Bible into everything? Every time we have a discussion about something important and you speak up, you you always want to say, well, the Bible says this or the Bible says that. Why do you bring the Bible into everything? And you know, I have to tell you, at first, I was a little bit, uh, I, I I was a young teenager when this happened. I have to tell you, at first when this occurred, I was a little bit upset and thought, you know, what what am I doing wrong? But the more I thought on it, and the older I got, Brother Alex, the more I came to realize that actually was quite a compliment. That as a teenager, I was at least interested enough in the Bible that I was trying, as best I knew how as a young Christian, to, to take everything that I looked at in life and say, how, how should I view it from the Bible? Now, I'm going to tell you that your preacher's not perfect. You already know that. The teenagers say they already know that. The preacher's not perfect. I make mistakes just like you make mistakes. But I will have to say, looking back on my Christian life, one of the things that I think I have tried to do right in my Christian life is to do what those teachers I had in my early childhood encouraged me to do. And that is to become acquainted with this book and as best I'm able, try to make my decisions in life based on what does this book say? And my beliefs about life based upon this book. The truth is, all of us are supposed to make our decisions, to live our lives, to view the things going on around us in the world by this book. We are supposed to have a biblical worldview. That is, a view by which you interpret the things around you and determine right and wrong. It's supposed to be a biblical worldview. 
My faith in God is supposed to affect every area of my life, not just a few. You know, the truth is, this way of thinking is not natural. And actually, it's very foreign. It's not, uh, the, the average person doesn't think, well, what does the Bible say about whatever this is coming up? The average person that you meet walking up down the street does not think that way. If you're saved and you're having a conversation with somebody that you work with, somebody you met at the grocery store, a family member perhaps even, the average person, can I say even the average Christian, does not think this way. Well, what does the Bible say about it? But we as Christians ought to be training ourselves that that is the way we think about things. It's not the natural way, but it's the way we ought to be training ourselves. What does the Bible say about it? Now, I don't think you have to say that out loud every time a conversation comes up, but that ought to be what goes through our minds whenever a conversation comes up or an issue arises. The first thing that comes to our mind, if we've trained ourselves correctly, ought to be, what does God say about it? What does the Bible say about it? And that ought to formulate our values, our convictions, our views of life. And it ought to help us interpret these many different things going on in the crazy world in which we live. We ought to interpret everything going on around us in light of what does the Bible say about it? How does the Bible apply to this situation? In the book of Ephesians chapter 5, listen to verses 15 and 16. Again, Paul's the one writing under inspiration of God, but he says this, Seeing then, see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Dear friend, I don't think I have to convince you this morning we live in evil times. We live in an evil day. Mike and I were talking about that just before he sat down this morning. We live in a day and time where evil and wickedness is all around us. Paul said, because of that, see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So, preacher, what does it mean then to walk circumspectly? Circum means around. Spect, spectly means to look. Remember the old name for glasses? Spectacles. So when I'm walking through life, I'm supposed to be walking through life looking around as I go. Lest I be caught off guard, taken by surprise, By the enemy. When I'm walking through the world, I'm supposed to make sure I know what's going on all around me. Because if you're not, dear friend, you're going to be caught off guard. You're going to be overwhelmed. Can I just use the word? You're going to be ambushed by the enemy when you least expect. We need to be walking circumspectly, knowing what's going on around me. Why? Because the days are evil. Now, how is it that I'm supposed to walk circumspectly? Yes, I'm supposed to know what's going on around me, but I'm supposed to interpret everything going on around me in light of this book. You see, Christians are not just supposed to follow their faith for the the little things that we think of as being outward Christian things. That is, we're not just, it doesn't just mean saying the blessing or asking grace before we eat the meal. That's not all of what it's supposed to be about to be a Christian. It's not just supposed to be about going to church on Sundays, though you ought to go to church on Sundays. 
It's not just supposed to be about having a family Bible that sits on the coffee table with all the births and deaths and marriages listed in the front of it. Those are outward things that perhaps identify a Christian, but that's not all that my faith is supposed to affect in my life. It's not just supposed to be a designation on an army dog tag. You say, preacher, what is that? The young people don't know what that is. Soldiers have to wear a metal tag around their neck with a chain on it in case they get killed in combat. It tells who they are. It also is supposed to have their faith on it. Now, I know way back in America uh, during World War II, you uh, uh, you could either be Protestant, Catholic, or Jew. Those were the three I think they would stamp on there. Nowadays, I guess there are probably a million and one things you can get stamped on there. I don't know. But it's supposed to be more than a dog tag hanging around my neck. Me being a Christian isn't just wearing a cross around my neck or a band around my arm that says the gospel or, uh, or, or walking around with a dog tag that says I'm Baptist or I'm a Christian. It's not even supposed to just be having good manners and polite company. Although a Christian ought to have good manners. Amen? Amen. But being a Christian, my faith is supposed to come out in every part of my life. Not just these little uh, places that we've shelved things away. No, it's supposed to affect every part of my Christian life. It's, a, it's, it's supposed to affect our view on everything in life. My faith should affect how I view everything going on in the world around me and in my own personal life too. When I was in college, I had, uh, I had to take, for my major, I had to take several philosophy classes. Everett, I had my first philosophy class when I was a sophomore in college. The professor's name was Dr. Kohler. He was a pretty neat individual, but he had some typical college professor ideas about him. In this one philosophy class, he was teaching us some of the different philosophies in the world, the way different people view the world and determine right and wrong, and He was teaching us about all the famous philosophers throughout history and what their ideas of right and wrong were and how they came up with those ideas. He taught us about utilitarianism. Utilitarianism is the philosophy that says whatever brings the most good to the most people, that's the right thing to do. I can tell you that's kind of the way America's making its decisions. Whatever the majority wants, that's what they get, even if it's not right. That's a wrong philosophy. That won't always lead you to what's right. Then he taught us about egoism. And that is, whatever's best for me, that's the right thing to do. Well, friends, that'll get you in a whole lot of trouble real fast. Just because it's what I want doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Then he taught us about uh, Kierkegaard and what's called existentialism. You've probably heard the word, but you say, I have no idea, preacher, what existentialism is. It's how one grapples with what they perceive as the meaningless point in life. This life seems meaningless. Why are we all here? Well, folks, I guess if a person's not saved, they might view this life as being meaningless. I can tell you as a Christian, I don't view life as being meaningless. I don't view it as being pointless. But it is possibly a good reason why there are so many people that are distraught, in despair, that are sad and doing sad things today, even to themselves, because they view life as meaningless. Well, existentialism, to me, isn't going to help anybody find the answers in life. It's only going to keep them mired in their miserable existence, perhaps. Then there was a fellow named Kant, K-A-N-T. And he had this theory called the categorical imperatives. 
he actually was trying to explain that there were absolute rights and wrongs without God as the reason. Now, folks, I do believe in absolute rights and absolute wrongs. I think this book teaches absolute rights and absolute wrongs. But if you try to come up with that conclusion without acknowledging the existence of an absolute, immutable, unchanging God, boy, I wouldn't want to have to argue that with folks. Maybe you can argue that, but life is still meaningless. If there's no God, if there's no Creator that made those absolute rules. So that, that just didn't fit. In fact, on more than one occasion in that class, when, I would, when the, the teacher would ask for input, because he would, he would love to try to get all the students in the class stirred up and involved in a discussion... On more than one occasion, he told me, he said, uh, Mr. McBerry, you are right there with Kant and his categorical imperatives. You believe in absolute rights and absolute wrongs. I said, no, sir, I'm not in his camp. I don't agree with him. I believe in absolute rights and wrongs, but for a totally different reason. And he said, no, he said, you're in that category. Brother Steve, he kept wanting to pigeonhole me into that category. He came up with, uh, well, he introduced us to what is today in Christian circles known as situation ethics. That is, what's right and wrong in this situation may not be what's right or wrong in this situation. I even remember a couple of the examples he came up with. And, of course, he was, he, he's teaching a class right here uh, in Georgia in the heart of Dixie, the Bible Belt with a bunch of uh, college students that at that time, 30 years ago, grew up in church. And uh, he's trying to to get us stirred up and get us involved in these discussions he was having. One of his examples was Eskimos. And he mentioned some particular tribe of Eskimos, and he said they, it's hard, harsh living conditions where they are. They can literally only provide for a certain number of mouths in each family. So, just as it is or has been in communist China for a number of years, if the first child born is a girl, they take the baby girl right after she's born. Abigail, you're not going to like this. They take the baby girl out away from the igloo onto the ice, set her down somewhere, over by herself, turn around, and walk back to the igloo, and leave her there to die. And he said, but for these Eskimos, that's not wrong, because they they have to have some men to take care of the family, to do the things that only men can do. And he said, they can't feed but a certain number of people because of the limited or the scarcity of food resources where they live. So he was trying to get these, uh, myself included, these young college students that were raised as Christians to say that, well, maybe in some circumstances it's okay to kill your innocent child. Situation ethics. By the way, that's the same argument in a different sense that the abortion crowd uses today too. Then he said, well, what about this? He said, if you, if you don't bite on that, let me give you another scenario. He said, during World War II, the Nazis would go along the, the coast there in Holland nightly on patrol, and they would ask all the ship owners, do you have any Jews on board your boat? And of course, if they were trying to help Jews escape the country... They might be inclined to say, well, no, I don't have any on board. But, of course, if they were found to have any Jews that they were hiding on board, they would be executed. And so he said, well, it's wrong to lie, isn't it? Yes, it's wrong to lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness. He said, so was it wrong for them to lie? He was trying to create a situation where uh, college-age kids... They didn't know anything, didn't know how to answer that. And in 
it, it, as a result, they would question their faith and everything they had been taught growing up. That's what he was trying to do as a college professor. By the way, same thing college professors are still trying to do in universities across America. So to our young people, when you're in college classrooms, just go ahead and keep in mind that belongs to the enemy. Don't change what you believe just because some pointy-headed professor uh, questions what the Bible says. But this, this philosophy professor, Dr. Kohler, he said, uh, all these different philosophies we've talked about, which one is yours? And at the end of the semester, or the end of the quarter at that time, he said, I want you to write a paper. He gave us a, a particular situation. We had to interpret it based on the philosophy we said was ours. And I said, Dr. Kohler, none of these philosophies is my philosophy. He said, one of them has to be. We've covered the whole gambit. We've covered pretty much all the major philosophies there are out there. I said, no, sir, you didn't. I said, there's still one you didn't cover. It's called the Bible. I said, I'm a Christian. I believe the Bible from cover to cover. It's the way I interpret everything. He said, you're just a little bit odd, aren't you? I said, you know what? I guess I am. But this is still my philosophy. And as Christians, we ought to have a biblical worldview. The way we interpret everything that's presented to us ought to go through a filter, and the filter ought to be, okay, how does this line up with what the Bible says? I'm not saying this preacher always gets it right. But that ought to be our goal. That ought to be what we're trying to do. It ought to be what we're striving for. It ought to affect what we think about politics. Oh no, the preacher's going to get political again from the pulpit. Yes, I am. And you know you can always call another preacher. How we view politics and the issues that arise in our own country ought to be interpreted in light of what this Bible says. The very precept upon which the American Republic was founded. From where do our rights come? That's where it starts. If you ask the average high school student, or even the average college student, they would say our rights come from the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. No, dear friend, that's why we're in such a mess today, because if our rights come from the Constitution or the Bill of Rights or Congress or the White House. They can be changed tomorrow. Our rights do not come from the Constitution or the Bill of Rights. My right to keep and bear arms does not come from the Second Amendment. It is outlined in the Second Amendment, but my right to keep and bear arms... My right to freedom of speech, my right to freedom of worship comes from God. Amen. Our rights Amen. come from God, not from government. You say, preacher, that's political. No, that's Bible. You see, I, I know I've done this before, but let me do it again this morning. God is the creator. He has all rights, all sovereignty, all authority. God created individual men and women. When He created us, He gave us some, but not all, of His rights, His sovereignty, His authority. I'm not God. I don't have all the rights that God has. I only have the ones He gave me. In the American system in which we live, individuals came together and formed the states. When we formed Georgia and all the other states... The people who lived in those states who were citizens gave the state some, but not all, of our authority to do certain things for our benefit. But the state doesn't have as many rights as I have because it got its rights from me, from the consent of the governed, by the way, as our founding fathers said. God created individuals who in America created the states 
The states, therefore, in turn, created the federal government. It's a compact or a contract between states. The federal government does not have as much authority as the states have. I'm talking about, in reality, not the way it's run today. In actuality, the federal government, the national government, only has the rights, sovereignty, authority that the states chose to give to it. And they could only give it powers that they already had. By the way, the list of things that the federal government has the authority to do, it's about that long. Not the list that they do today, but the list that they were given by the states. It's about that long. What we've done in American society, though, is we flip that upside down on its head so that Washington's at the top, then the states, then individuals, and God is somewhere down at the bottom if he's even getting honorable mention. But the way that it's supposed to be is that I received my rights from God so I owe him everything, every consideration. He's the rule maker. I'm supposed to follow the rules. I could go on in the political realm. There's capital punishment. I ought to view that, not by how I feel about it one day to the next, but what does the Bible say about it? When it comes to abortion, Innocent children being created in the image of God. I ought to view that issue in light of the Bible, not whatever happens to be the political winds blowing at any given moment in time in American public opinion. I think about so-called science. How I view what scientists tell us ought to be interpreted in light of this Bible. The origin of man, how he got here, Evolution, what Paul calls science falsely so-called in the New Testament. It might pass for science in some places, but not in this pulpit. Because if it contradicts this Bible, it's just wrong. Amen. And whether I can prove it to you under a microscope or not, it's wrong. Yes. This, whatever this book says is what's right. There are so many examples from history, archaeology, and science where man said this is the way it is, contradicting the Bible, only to have someone discover 50 years, 100 years, or 500 years later that what the Bible said was actually right all along. They were just catching up to the Bible. Whatever science says about cosmology, so-called outer space, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the earth. If it contradicts this Bible, it's just wrong. And whether I've ever been there and seen it with my own eyes, or whether I can prove it to you with a microscope or a telescope, doesn't matter to me. All I care about is what this book says. Because I know that everything God has ever said to me through the pages of this book I have found to be true. And I'm not about to start listening to some scientist who thinks he knows better than the Bible when I've found everything in this book that I'm able to prove to be true. Our social values ought to be interpreted with a biblical worldview. Family is supposed to be a husband, a wife, God and whatever children God gives them. Marriage is between a husband, a wife, and God. Yes. Not any other combination you can come up with. In the book of Genesis, the Bible said that a man, for that reason, a man should leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife. That's a family. That's a marriage. But our social values and the social issues of the day ought to be interpreted in light of what does the Bible say? Pornography, drunkenness, manhood, 
womanhood, the roles of men and women in the home, in the church, in society. They ought to be interpreted not by does my best friend like this or not, or does mom or daddy like this or not, but what does the Bible say? That ought to determine it for us. How to raise children. As they tell us it's supposed to be child rearing instead of child raising, my daddy definitely knew how to rear his children, and he did that on a pretty regular basis. Our work ethic. I'll be honest with you. I'm disgusted with the work ethic I see around us in our society today, in America. A place that was once known for our work ethic in America. We went after church one Sunday night recently down to a local 24-hour restaurant to get a bite to eat before going home. They were closed, and a sign on the door said, closed until 9 o'clock because the shift members didn't show up. That's a 24-hour restaurant. By the way, they are open 365 and a fourth days of the year. Never close. But they were closed that evening because the workers just didn't show up. So we went across the street to another 24-hour restaurant in one of the truck stops down here, one exit south of here, Brother Steve. And sure enough, they had a, a ribbon up across the entrance to the restaurant there that said, closed, not enough help. We have people that don't care about getting up and going to work. I'm not talking about people that can't go to work for medical reasons and other things like that. I'm talking about people that could go to work and won't go to work. And they'd rather sit at home and collect COVID checks or this or that check instead of going to work. The book of Colossians 2 verse 8 says, Beware lest philosophy and vain deceit spoil you. We have a lot of Americans, can I say even a lot of Christians, that have been spoiled, ruined. The way they think has been spoiled through man's philosophy and vain deceit. That man is better than this. I deserve more than this. I'm not just talking about lost people. Christians living this way, thinking this way, acting this way. Christians use all the wrong things to determine their views, their values, and their convictions. Some Christians, I've even heard them say it, go to their horoscope every morning. And if you do, don't tell the preacher. I don't want to know. But I'm not going to go to my horoscope to find out what my day is going to be like or what I ought to do today, that's not what I'm going to do. When I get up in the morning, this is where I'm supposed to go to get me started for the day, not the horoscope. And there are Christians that mama and daddy is who determines their rights and wrongs. I love my mama and daddy. They raised me on the Bible. And most of the time, Alex, I still agree with them. T.R., not all the time. But mom and daddy is not the final say. Mom and daddy is not whether something's right or wrong. Only if what mom and daddy says lines up with this book. Amen. CNN is not the final authority. And bef before you get too comfortable, let me hasten to say Fox News Channel isn't either. Your school chums that you graduated with, they're not supposed to be what determines what your values and your views are. Your spouse is not to be the one who determines those for you. Hopefully you have a spouse that puts this book first, puts God first. And if they do, their views are going to line up with this book. But if their views don't line up with this book, guess what's supposed to be on top? 
This book. God. God's Word. Can I also say the preacher is not supposed to be the final authority either. Whether you're talking about the curly-headed preacher or this preacher or anybody else. That's why I encourage you every week, bring your Bible with you. Whatever I read, you read it for yourself out of the pages of this book. Don't ever trust just because the preacher said it, it must be so. If it lines up with this book, it's so. If the preacher says it and it don't line up with this book, it ain't so. Whatever this book says, let God be true and every man a liar. Amen? Amen. So make sure your preacher's preaching right. But there are a lot of preachers out there preaching a lot of things that aren't in this book. Make sure your preacher is. The Bible alone should be our guide. It's why we should read it and study it. Not just here and there haphazardly, but it's why you and I ought to be reading and studying this book daily, weekly, on purpose, trying to glean from it. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. All of this book is for me to be studying. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us to rightly divide the word of truth. That is, take it in its proper context. More than a few cults have been started by taking a verse out of context and building a whole religion around it. Read it in its proper context. As one of my Bible teachers used to say in Bible college, compare Scripture with Scripture. Always interpret Scripture in the light of other Scripture so you come out getting it right when you're understanding what it says. This book is to be our standard, our measuring stick. Brother Kevin, I, I used to um, go over to my great aunt and uncle's house there in McDonough. Their house was built in, I think, 1896. When they passed away, my brother and I inherited it, and I bought his half of the house. Up in the attic, there were a bunch of old books and other things that were just a treasure trove to go through. One of the things up in the attic of that old house was a planter's warehouse yardstick in, propped up in the corner of the attic. And uh, having grown up in McDonough, planter's warehouse was just it was part of McDonough. And I remember going over and looking at that and uh, taking that yardstick. I carried it back downstairs. And the next time I needed to measure something... Uh, for some kind of chart I was doing on poster board or something. I, I put it down there to draw the, to use it as a straight edge, and I found that the straight edge went like this. Because that planter's warehouse yardstick, 36 inches, had been leaning in the corner so long, it wasn't straight anymore. It had a curve to it that I had not noticed when I carried it downstairs. There are too many Christians measuring what's right and wrong by a crooked yardstick. Any of those other yardsticks I just mentioned are the wrong ones to measure by. This book is the straight. It's the standard. It's what we're supposed to measure right and wrong by. This book. And can I say that studying the Bible is going to be a lifelong adventure. Miss Mary, can I ask how long you've been a Christian? Uh, Roughly. Since I was 16 years old. Since you were 16 years old. So more than 50 years, right? So more than 50 years. Miss Mary, do you know everything that's in the Bible yet? No. She said no. I'm glad she told the truth this morning. <laughs> you know, it's going to be a lifelong endeavor for all of us studying our Bible, reading our Bible. But it, it is an adventure. 
But the more we know the pages of this book, the easier it gets as we go along to look at the things going on in the world around us and say, ah, I recognize what's going on here. I know how that fits in with Scripture. The Christian that goes through their lives just kind of haphazardly looking at the Bible now and then, going to church here and again, but not studying it to learn it, they might get some things wrong and there might be some things so glaringly obvious in the world around us that they'll, they'll get something right every now and then. But as a Christian, we ought, to be, we ought to be in this book on a regular basis, not just when we're at church, not just when the preacher's the one doing the teaching. We ought to live in the pages of this book, read it and make it a part of who we are. So why should we have a biblical worldview? Because our purpose is to glorify God. The logo for Pinnacle Baptist Church has a verse on it. Colossians 1.18. It says that in all things, He might have the preeminence. That's my purpose in being here is to bring honor and glory to God. There's no other reason for, for Ray to be here but to bring glory to God. If I'm not doing that, He'd be better off to just take me out of the world. And Paul said he had done that with some Christians, by the way. My purpose is to bring honor and glory to God. I'm going to say something else that will shock you here. My purpose in being here is not to win other people to Christ. Preacher, I thought every Christian is supposed to win people to Christ. We are. And that does bring glory to God. But my overall purpose is to bring glory to God. Winning people to Jesus is just one way I do that. There are other ways I bring glory to God too. Living a holy, godly life in front of the world around us brings glory to God too. That's why here at Pinnacle Baptist Church, we're not going to take uh, doing things the right way and trying to be holy and pleasing to God. We're not going to throw that out the window just so we can get a huge crowd in here so we can supposedly share Jesus with them. I'm supposed to be holy just as much as I'm supposed to be winning people to Jesus because neither of them is the main goal. The main goal is to get glory for God. And too many churches have thrown this one out or thrown that one out and they're way over there on one end of the spectrum or the other when we're supposed to be bringing glory to God, not throwing one or another out. So as I finish this morning, can I ask you, old friend, when things come up in the news, in your house, in your life, do you, is the first thing you think of Maybe not said out loud, but is the first thing you think, okay, what does the Bible say about this? If it's not, could I challenge you to start making that the first question? And to start studying your Bible, reading it for yourself, and develop a biblical worldview. You won't know all the answers right away. You won't even know them 50 years from now. But I bet you'll know some people you can go to and say, hey, can you help me find the answer to this in the Bible? Make this book your guide through life. Would you stand quietly and reverently to your feet, please? Brother Jim, if you and Miss Mary would come. Brother Jim, if you would select our, our invitational hymn, when we finish our prayer, we'll sing together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank You for an opportunity to come and be together, Lord, in Your house this morning. But what a waste it would be, dear God, if we left the same way that we came. And Lord, I pray that every one of our folks that are here this morning, whether member or visitor alike, Lord, that we would develop a biblical worldview. That the way we interpret the things going on in the world around us and the way we determine what's right and wrong in our own lives will always be based on what does the Bible say.
Help us to be people of the book. Lord, help us to love you like we ought to. Lord, I pray you'd be pleased when you look down at our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.